Fun. It is really my privilege uh, to get to introduce my friend, Big Island Board, Kanaka Maui, which is the Hawaiian word for Hawaiians, by the way. Um, assistant professor at the University of, Color of California, San Diego uh, in anthropology. Uh, Kiolo got his PhD in genome sciences from the University of Washington in Seattle. He's published a million articles on uh, human genetics and biomedicine and ancient genomes and indigenous data sovereignty. And he's been in the New England Journal of Medicine and Nature and Proceedings of the Royal Society, which I have not cracked. I don't know how you got that. That was awesome. <laughs> Uh, his topics, uh, I love, his t paper titles are great. So um, he wrote a critique of the All of Us program he called The Illusion of Inclusion, which is a wonderful title. Um, and, uh, you know, he's done, he does hardcore stuff. He has a genomic analysis of the history of Mycobacterium leprae in the Pacific Islands and all this kind of cool shit. He's won a bunch of prizes. I have this ridiculous list that I'm not going to read. Um, but uh, the MIT Solve competition he won. Um, the Smithsonian's given him prizes, National Geographic's given him prizes. I, I think of Kiolu as, as part of this group of young indigenous scientists who have really just lit the world on fire with indigenous perspectives. You know, Maui Hudson and Nanny Ba Garrison and Crystal Sotsi and Renee Begay and Jocelyn Lee and Christina Claw. And, you know, Joey Richetta is not that young, but he's kind of part of the crew. <laughs> you know, I, anyway, they've really changed the relationship between indigenous people and, and genomic science in, in a way that I really appreciate and think is very important. One of my favorite contributions of Kiolo, and I won't go on for very long, I promise, is not a, even academic or policy, and it's not even really teaching, but it was this museum exhibit he curated for the Bishop Museum in Honolulu. Um, where he unpacked and re-envisioned this long history of racist science in Hawaii. There's a collection of photographs and plaster busts and measurements and data collected about, you know, what's a, what do Hawaiians look like by this anthropologist named Sullivan. Um, and, you know, it, it, it wasn't even that long ago. So almost exactly 100 years ago, Sullivan presented his results um, at the International Conference on Eugenics. Okay, in 1921. And what Kiolu did was not only unpack this, the racism and show you know, the tools that he used and how it's uh, often done in the name of science, but he found the subjects of Sullivan's work and their descendants sometimes and added videos where they talked about their lives and their experiences and of being subjects as well as just their lives as, as Hawaiians which I found just such a compelling and lovely way to turn an awful history into giving voice to indigenous people who have so much to tell the world. And so I, I'm, I'm gonna stop here, and I'm very excited to hear what Kiolo has to say. Come on up here, buddy. Aloha kako. Ha oli makikio. Ua mau keo kaina i kapono o Hawaii. Nei. Kau inoa. Ke olu. I'm not going to do the whole thing in Olelo Hawaii, but I was wondering how much of our language you've heard while you're here. If you've heard words other than aloha, put your hand up. Okay, good, that's a start, that's a solid start. Good, 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 good. Who booted up their Duolingo before they came up in here? <laughs> Google Translate is super accurate, I agree. It's getting there. But um, mahalo nui, thank you so much for having me. In Hawaiian, I said, Happy New Year. Thanks for having me. Welcome to my home. Welcome to the big island. The actual name of this place is Moku Oke Ave. Anyone who can tell me what that means gets a lay. Besides Larry, because you might know. Anyone? Don't look it up. Somebody take a guess. Anyone? Hmm? It is, but it means something else. It smells good. Okay. This thing is still up here. I'll have all kinds of questions throughout this. 
This valley that you see behind you is called Waipiko Valley. Does anybody, has anyone been there? Yeah, it's really remarkably beautiful. It is actually next to two other valleys, Pololu Valley and Waimanu Valley. And that is where my ancestors come from. That is quite literally the aina, the land that has shaped our genomes over time. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. Um, but first, more on me. I'm at the University of Cal uh, <laughs> Colorado, God damn it. Um, University of California, San Diego, actually located in La Jolla, that's where I work. Um, do we have any other UC people here? We do, all right, eat your hearts out. We are ranked perennially number one by Surfer Magazine every year. Mm -hmm. I recently started the Indigenous Futures Institute at the University of California, San Diego. We focus on everything from data futures to architecture, education, remote sensing, all kinds of different projects where we're thinking about this. Here are some of my colleagues. And for those of you that are coming up in the ranks, if you're a postdoc, we're hiring. We're hiring 12 different people. Uh, let me know, please check out the webpage below and shoot me a note and we can have a conversation about that. It's uh, a, a totally new initiative called Designing Just Futures. And if we're gonna talk about the future, I should talk about one of the most futuristic places, which is where I'm from, which is where we currently are. Hawaii. Nei. Now you can't say Hawaii nei unless you're in Hawaii. You can only say Hawaii. Um, but the history here is pretty remarkable. We created some of the first color newspapers in the world, some of the first access programs for universal health care through Queens in 1859. And famously, we had electricity in Iolani Palace well before the White House in Washington, DC. And we have been thinking futuristically about many things, but most importantly, agriculture, climate resilience, those things go without saying when you're here in Hawaii. My ancestors are actually from Pololu Valley, beautiful place, please go there. Now this island is super unique for a lot of different reasons. It is one of the most biodiverse places in the world. It has some of the most biodiverse soil regiments in the world. We have elevation. Oh, I think I'm getting some feedback here. Uh, a little bit. Oh, 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 yeah, I think it's sorted. Thank you. Um, we are also, though, the extinction capital of the world and the invasive species capital of the world simultaneously. And if you look at, let's just turn away from the Aina and the Moana, right? The natural world our ecosystem, and let's, let's think about human diversity. We're, we are, this county, Hawaii County, is the n most diverse county in the United States of America by any standard metric. We have four of the top 11 in the United States of America. We have been mixing genomes for some time. Kohala, for example, which is where my ancestors are from, is very famous for being Kanaka and Pocho. Kanaka, Hawaiian, native Hawaiian, and Portuguese, but not from Lisbon, from places like the Azores and, and Madeira. And if you're like me and you grow up in a place like this, then you start to ask questions about where we came from. And we are presented often the Polynesian Triangle, located in the largest and oldest and, dare I say it, best ocean on our planet. Um, and understanding our diaspora and our migratory history throughout this, 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 this incredible, vast, abysmal space is pretty remarkable. It's pretty hard to do. There are multiple lines of evidence that people do this. And, and you start to wonder, where do all of these time estimates come from, right? Some of my colleagues here uh, actively think about these questions along with myself. Alex is here. Um, and they're still under consideration. There's still friction. We're still arguing about how this happened and how this occurred and the technologies that were used. And I kind of want to walk through that history of how we know the data science behind that and 
who has actually had the opportunity to prioritize those narratives. Narratives, using what tools and what data and why. So often, one of the most famous archaeological examples you would find in where? Someone tell me. It's up there. Where? Rapa Nui. This gentleman. Come here, sir. Come on up. Oh. You guys can share, yeah? It's big enough for both of your heads. No, no. Here you go, sir. All right. Yeah. All right. We also use applied mathematics. Some of my most favorite applications of simulations were in the 1970s at the University of Manchester, thinking about the early computation and the variables involved in understanding how we get to the most remote places in the world. The Maori will tell you they're the best navigators. The Tahitians will tell you they're the best navigators. I will tell you why we're the best, and that is because we are located in the northern hemisphere, and you need to use a completely different calculus, a completely different set of stars to find your way here from the Marquesas. And that's why we're the best, non-negotiable. But <laughs> um, we also have the great fortune of using our mo'oku auhau, that's the native Hawaiian word in Olelo Hawaii for your genome, our genealogy. This is a great way, as many of you know, how we can sort of retrace our diaspora and our migratory history. So I want to bring you to this map. Does anyone know this map? Does it look familiar? I love maps. I've been looking at them for some time. No one knows this map. This is a very, very famous map, and I'm going to tell you why it is and how this came to be. Um, but this map represents a lot of different things. It represents first contact between indigenous communities and Western communities. It represents the many and multiple ways of knowing and expertise. It also represents partners and not subjects. Okay? So let's walk through that. <clears throat> so, Captain Cook arrived here some time ago. This is how it started. This is a rendition from an artist by the name of Herb Kane. Herb Kane is a really interesting futurist. He would, you know, manifest these things. We'll get to his importance a little later. He was an artist, he was a visionary, he was an engineer. But this is one of his compositions of the HMS resolution making contact for the first time with our traditional va'a. It's a really beautiful photo. And that's how it started. First contact, trading, maybe trading a few whiskeys for some ava, right? That's how it ended, with us clubbing Captain Cook to death. Some miscommunication, right? Some hierarchical power imbalances going on. Um, but the question of how and why Captain Cook arrived here is actually related to science and the pursuit of understanding the celestial sphere, our natural world, and physics. This is Samuel Wallace. He first thought that it would be a good idea to end up in a place called Tahiti to measure the transit of Venus. Is anybody familiar with this? Yeah, it's pretty cool. This is one of, one of one of the, the, the kind of most interesting scientific collaborations that you've probably never heard of, but it really had to do with understanding the transit of Venus and understanding our celestial sphere, and, and, and it really involved a bunch of characters. Cook, though, was not from royalty. He was not some well-to-do, white privilege captain. He worked his way up there because he was an incredible cartographer. He had been in many other places all around the world. He came from humble beginnings. Here are a few documents from his travels. Um, and here is one of the most remote places in the world. And he finds himself in this place, Rayatea. 
Rayate is extremely beautiful. And he likely ended up at this Marai, which is one of the, it's like the launch pad for voyaging throughout the Pacific. And it's called Tapu Tapu Atea. And he ends up there. And if you like to dive and fish like I do, this is one of the best places in the world. It's probably second to Hawaii. <clears throat> and he meets a gentleman by the name of Tupaya. Put your hand up if you've heard that name before. One, two, three, four, okay, five, six, all right, we got a handful, we got some people. Tupaya was, who, ha, who runs a lab here? Who has a golden goose? All of you have a golden goose. You have a golden goose, a golden cow, somebody who is smarter, and you might take credit for their work, or maybe history remembers that context in a certain way their accomplishments, their moments of genius. Um, but Cook is often remembered as the greatest navigator in human history, when the reality was his golden goose was the actual genius. Tupaya was a person who taught himself English in 18 months. He had never touched a paintbrush. This is the reason I didn't want to do this talk outside, because I wanted to show you this art. I thought it would be a shame if you didn't see this. This guy had never done an oil painting, or sorry, uh, watercolor in his life. And these are some of the manifestations of the things that they would see on their journeys throughout the Pacific. It is said that he had memorized the locations of over 1,100 different islands. That is profound. Yeah, just a few more of these beautiful images that he created. And at some point, there is a distillation of the communication between Cook and Tupaya. And they end up coming up with this map. It is commonly referred to as Tupaya's map. It is one way of thinking about the world. It is one way of visualizing. It is one way of creating a map. Now, the way Tupaya would do it is he would say a chant. And by Going back through his lexicon, he would, he would understand what the island's relationship were to one another, but it wasn't a bird's eye view. And so how many of you have actually thought about the fact that this is one way of thinking about the world? It's a way that we represent space, it's a way that we represent time, but it's not the way that everyone thinks about that, and in fact, the best navigators in the world do not think about space like this. This is a distillation, it's not dynamic. Um, but it is the fruit of an incredible collaboration. You can imagine them sitting together in the captain's quarters, drinking whiskey, pouring over this document, creating and collaborating something that truly represented a partnership. And that's pretty cool. OK, so let's go to our second story. I should say that before we get to the second story, um, a whole bunch of other things happened in places like Hawaii. OK? Uh, you have the gnarliest after effects and aftermath of colonialism. You have the illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom. You have the imprisonment of Queen Liliokalani in our palace. Um, and that's unfortunate. But that doesn't mean there aren't other opportunities for scientific partnership along the way, right? And then that brings us to our second story, and that is this man. Anybody know who that guy is? Yes. Can I hear it? Thor hired all, that is right. We can think about him as like a National Geographic kind of playboy. All the wrong ideas, and we'll get to that, and why. But he was brave, he was courageous. He tried and created something called the Experimental Archaeology Movement, and we'll get there. But the reason I mention him is, is that we have to really think about who's in control of the narratives that we create when we build science. Who's chiefly responsible for biasing data? Whose hypotheses are we testing? And my favorite, is that even your scientific question to ask? Okay, let that sit. All right. So hired all thought that our ancestors actually came from South America first. He propagated knowingly, unknowingly, or otherwise, this narrative that our ancestors were helpless and voyaged over on accident. 
and that there's no way that we could have created things like catamarans and used the celestial sphere and bird migrat migratory patterns and all types of scientific metadata in real time to find the most remote places on planet Earth. And that was a really dangerous narrative. And he wrote a book about it. He built a boat, which was actually a raft. He looks pretty serious in this photo. And he sailed it. And when he sailed it, it didn't go very well. His failure, though, and the way that he propagated this narrative resulted in what we now refer to as the Hawaiian Renaissance. And so, Herb Kane, who we spoke about, had a dream. And he partnered with another person by the name of Ben Finney. Has anybody ever heard of Ben Finney? You have. Incredible navigator, incredible futurist, builder extraordinaire. Worked with, so, the team, Herb Kane, Hawaiian, Ben Finney, not Hawaiian, worked together, and they built the first model for Hokulea. Has anyone heard of Hokulea? It's one of the most famous sailing vessels ever. It is outstanding. And the first model they built, they sailed out of UCSB, and it sank. Shit happens, right? The second one, though, did not sink. The second one made it all the way to Tahiti. In 1976, and this photo is one of my favorites, and you can see this boat is almost sinking into the Papeete Harbor. People are so excited. Now this moment represented our community proving to the rest of the world that we can utilize experimental archeology, span that we can sail using traditional methods from Hawaii to Tahiti, no problem, and we'll sail it back because the rest of the world didn't believe us because of harmful narratives. And in that sense, I'll teach you a little more Hawaiian. It is ikavamamua kavamahope. This is us walking backwards into the future, recognizing the mistakes others have made, being careful about that, but painting a, an equitable vision of the future. Um, and that's why when we get to use genomic data and information at that scale to recast and create a higher resolution version of our voyaging history, it feels really good. It feels really good to do that. It feels really good to work with our own communities to talk about what we can use genetic information to do. And it feels really good to publish that in nature. Also, <laughs> it feels really, really good when you get to see your language in a premier journal like that because it forces the rest of the world to speak your language. Now, it doesn't mean that the media is going to kind of adopt it in a, in a, in a way that, that's honest. I mean, science covered it, and they said no one could have predicted DNA offers surprises on how Polynesia was settled. Well, we know, we just, we just went over that. That's not the case. Um, but if you're not happy with the way that people write these types of narratives, then do it yourself. So I took that upon myself to write about this in Scientific American and talk, and I wrote this as a love letter to my community. And I included a picture of our va'a, Kiakahi. This is on the other side of the island. This is the only photo credit I will ever get in Scientific American. But it is a, a, a stunningly beautiful uh, boat, and it is the exact type of technology that we would have used to get here. Probably a little bigger, right? Um, and in that, Kind of, kind of article in that pursuit, I, I centered it around questions that are relevant to our community. And that is, well, if we want to talk about population collapses, bottlenecks, founder effects, then let's talk about the effect of colonialism and, and European contact in shaping our immune systems today, right? That is ongoing work. This is a really interesting paper uh, from John Lindo looking at HLA diversity. And these are some of the new things that we're working on in our laboratory. And taking it beyond the sort of just so story of correlation and reverse engineering this in cell lines using specific types of genome editing. Um, and we all know, and this is, this is from Melinda Mills uh, GWAS diversity monitor, if you're familiar, that there is a dearth of genetic uh, diversity data amongst the human 
population amongst, amongst many of our different communities, specifically indigenous people. We, we don't have the data to make a lot of the claims that we want. But even more, more dangerous, and I think a lot of people here are working towards a better end, right? We want to see more diverse data sets. We want to do that in a way that is a reflection of the diversity we see every day as we walk around in places like Hawaii or California or Texas or Colorado, right? Um, but what is even more concerning is that 72% of genetic discoveries have taken places in three countries. So that means that our communities are forced to outsource our genomes to places like California or, God forbid, Cambridge, Massachusetts, <laughs> right? No, but it's real. I mean, so if you want to talk about infrastructure building and capacity building, then, you know, poof, where's Illumina, right? We need, we don't need our biological samples to leave this place. We need to build our infrastructure locally. And that's a lot of the things that we're doing. Um, okay, so I now want to talk about something that Larry alluded to. And this is the, the dangers of what this leads to. This scenario leads to us being studied and not us studying ourselves and prioritizing our questions. And some of those darkest perspectives we covered in a museum exhibit that we just wrapped up at the Bishop Museum, which is in Honolulu, and we called it Regenerations, Challenging Scientific Racism in Hawaii. And this was the scariest project I've ever been a part of, period, because there was a lot on the line. Our representation of eugenic research uh, could have been interpreted by our own community in a way in which, you have to remember, as a Hawaiian person, if we fuck this up, I can't come home. I can't come home for Christmas. I got people talking to my mom about how rotten my research program is, right? So we have to be on our best behavior and we have to build projects with our community. And that's exactly what we did. And luckily, it was wildly successful. And I'll tell you why. And I have a few kind of like playbook pro tip recommendations on how we did that. Um, and you can check out some of the media. It is also online. Um, pretty cool that the first day we opened up our exhibit, we had a rainbow, an anui anui. Um, we also get the most rainbows in the world. But we, we had to deal with some unique circumstances while we were putting this together. One, COVID was reshaping the world. It was reshaping the way we communicate. So a lot of our dialogue was pretty challenging, right? We were also building an exhibit right in the face of white supremacy. And that changed the stakes, it changed our perspective, it changed the way we communicated a lot of different ideas. And Larry kind of alluded to this, but what we found was we uncovered a whole bunch of eugenic medicalized photographs of Native Hawaiian people in our museum. And the question was what to do with it. And so we reached out to our community and we said, listen, is that your grandfather? Is that your grandmother? Is that your auntie? Or people like myself were going through and saying, that's a family member that I have that I didn't even know of. And in those moments, you realize how powerful these tools could be, right? And so as we dig into it, we realize that Lewis Sullivan was not a good person. He was trained at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories. He spent time there. They would have uh, eugenic conferences there um, in, in 1918. Here's a picture of that. And I actually took classes there. Here's me and a uh, very controversial character at the time. I didn't know what Cold Spring Harbor's history was. So in a, in a, in a way, it was like coming back full circle and reinvestigating these ideas about what is the anthropology of the past? The way we create measurements, the way we make data, who's doing the measuring, right? All of these different tools, anthropometry, phrenology, hair color, eye color, skin color, all of this loaded stuff. And then in this exhibit, we made comparisons with 
what's going on today, and that is the anthropology of the present. Who's getting access to human remains? We're a community of people involved in population genetics. It is our job to hold people accountable in our community so that they're doing pono ethical research, right? So if you shouldn't have access to human remains because of X, Y, or Z reasons, because you don't know what the provenance is of something, or you know what the provenance is and you don't care because you want to make a big paper in a marquee journal. And I can assure you there are ways to make papers in marquee journals that do not involve defiling people's ancestors. Look at my CV. Um, but also, we, we have to look at who's in control of the data. Where is it stored? Who's, you know, who's accessing it? What's the privacy around that? And um, what are the emerging sort of point of care tools for creating way more ubiquitous access to genome sequencing? And so a lot of those themes we incorporated in our exhibit for the first time. Um, Here's a look at some of those photos. Here's me with one of my friends and her daughter. We just happened to be wearing the same you know, color shirt that day. Here's a look at some of the guests uh, that helped us curate this. One of my tips is we worked with our own community to build something that was special. We asked people what their opinions were of things before they went live. We built consensus every day. We iterated, we co-designed, we co-developed. Here's just a, some of the photos of some of the weird stuff that we included. Um, one of the artifacts that was the most interesting is also an ancestor. That lei, palaoa, lei palaoa, that lei, is actually made of human hair. Human hair. And when I found out about what, oh, excuse me, what, Christie's was doing, I was really mad, really, really mad, the most upset I've been in a long time, because I found out they were selling our ancestors' hair to the highest bidder. And so that prompted us to think about that in ways where we really had to create and safeguard access to our ancestors' DNA, right? What are the tools and technologies that we can develop to create accountability and transparency in the space of uh, ancient genomics and access and understanding provenance. So we started thinking like ADT. Um, whoops, there you go. And we entered in this MIT Solve competition um, and we had an incredible team of people. And one of the things that struck me was the Hope Diamond. And the Hope Diamond was stolen like I don't even know how many times, I think three separate times. And every time it, was, it resurfaced, it was smaller, right? So that, it got me thinking, what does that mean? Like, why uh, and how does this happen? And that is a really profound idea for ancient genomics, because if you have remains that weigh a certain amount, amount um, and you do one experiment, and it works, and you have less of that artifact, then, then that's data, right? That's metadata, right? Everyone in this room, right? That's like basic mathematics. Or if you have negative results, you should report those. So basic things like that, uh, you start to fill in the real picture of how we can create a more ethical way to do ancient genomic research, right? Um, who knows that half of this Denis Denisovan um, pinky was lost in the mail? Facts, disappointing, part of our shared history as human beings. Things like that should never happen. So we started thinking about ways to connect various forms of data on ledger systems. Um, and if you have a knee-jerk reaction when I say ledger system or blockchain, and you associate it with Sam Bankman-Fried, FTX, uh, you know, cryptocurrency, NFTs, you need to do some reading because it's a really powerful tool. It's a powerful tool to create accountability. It is a connective tissue for decentralization. And it can be used in a number of different ways. We also started thinking about disruptive and non-invasive technologies. What does this look like to everyone? 
mulch. Yes, mulch. It's just, this is what every single attempt at excavating boats underwater looked like until the development of PEG resuspension technology. And then you get these beautiful reliefs on the sides of Maori canoes by being patient and waiting for the right technologies to come your way. Um, there's a lovely book about this called The Man Who Thought Like a Ship. There are also new avenues to think about what you can garner from soil itself. So you could think about this from the point of view of uh, my colleague Ben Verno, and you can actually assemble the genomes of a Neanderthal from sediment from a meter away from its remains, which is remarkable that they can do that. That is profound. But you can also think about like what and how people would use that technology in terms of claims to land, thinking about genealogical connections to places. That's more of an indigenous perspective, right? But it's also valuable in that we're thinking about how to use those technologies. Um, and in the space of ancient genomics, I'll just leave it at this, authorization is not building consensus. Just because the six people you needed to sign off on a piece of paperwork gave you access doesn't mean that that's good science, right? And that sort of leaves a, leads us to why data sovereignty is important. Many of you have probably heard about this. It's sort of popping up all over the place. And, you know, loosely defining data and sovereignty is not something that I need to do for everyone in this room. Um, but they are directly connected to commodification. And I think the more interesting argument for everyone that is here today, because we're all data scientists here, is that data is the most valuable resource on the planet, surpassing oil in 2018. And once you start thinking about data as a resource, right, like cobalt, like water, like oil, like timber, like diamonds, you start understanding that it has real tangible value for people. And indigenous people know that. Everyone in this room knows that. 23andMe knows that. Ancestry.com definitely knows that. And even in 2020, you have institutions and scientists trying to commodify exclusive use of genetic mutations. And if you're like me, and Mary Claire King was a professor in my graduate school, and the, the knockdown, drag out lawsuit that was with her and Myriad Genomics would lead you to believe that things like this shouldn't happen now, right? But they do. And so that has prompted us to think about what the future is when our community members are in control of that information, right? And what does the, the future of data sovereignty look like? Well, for us, it's all about vertical integration. Vertical integration of all of the suite of tools, the types of education that need to happen. And Henry Ford knew this, and that's why he bought acres and acres of land in the Amazon so that he could be in control of every single component in the development of Model T, of the Model T, which revolutionized transportation. Amazon.com knows this. And the Native Biodata Consortia knows this. And that's why we founded and created the first Genome Sequencing Center and Biorepository on Indigenous Land in the United States history. And it's doing really well. We're thinking about utilizing new technologies to serve our interests, like digital ledger systems. Um, we're exploring the many and new and different ways that people are utilizing machine learning, and federated learning, so that we can better collaborate with our partners. We are creating vast new networks of indigenous scientists that are focused on many forms of artificial intelligence. We're training the next generation of students to be better coders. All right, next one. If you can answer this, you get a lay. How many coding or scripting languages have been created by indigenous people? Name one. I'll give you a hint. It's one letter. Okay, somebody said C. Who said, whoever said R, it's correct, but I want to know why. Did you say one letter? 
<laughs> no, but but like but like but why other than one the one letter thing? You know, that was my hint, but New Zealand. Hmm? New Zealand. New Zealand, yes. Good. That's a good start. It's actually Aotearoa. And the gentleman's name is Ross Ihaka. And he's Maori. And how many of you have used that language and not known that? Nobody gets this one, but we'll get back to you. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, we're also moving past thinking about ethical engagement. How many people have referenced this paper in their work and not done what we told you to do? A lot of people do. A lot of people. And that has frustrated me to, to, to no end. Because you can put out the ethical playbook for something, but that doesn't mean that people are going to actually follow the playbook. So that leads us to thinking about other ways to be more creative, like playing capitalism. So we think about equitable benefit sharing models. We start companies that allow us to do this and work with and provide equity and royalties for the communities that we work with and provide sequencing data for. Um, we're working on a giant new gout study <laughs> and um, it's going pretty well. I have to say that I'm very proud of this study from top down, bottom up because if it does work, it's gonna disrupt a lot of what everyone in this room does and we will provide affordable access and free access and subsidized access to the drugs that we create beyond just providing 4% of equity. But that doesn't mean that there's no substitute for grassroots research and democratizing technology and all of the new ways in which we have entry points for bringing these technologies into communities that allow us to D-black box, genome sequencing, computation, PCR, many of the regular tools that we use. Here's us using a handful of those tools in Moorea. Um, and here are others and friends thinking about decentralizing access to molecular biology broadly. And I should note that Moderna and Pfizer are thinking about this and manufacturing things on site. And so are we. Um, finally, I'll leave you with a new uh, sort of project that we're working on with National Geographic, establishing their indigenous data sovereignty standards. As you know, they started the National Geographic project, and that was a complete disaster in terms of access. Uh, so we've created the Pae Pae Ike Ao Mana Mana, which is the platform to the cloud. And this is our, our version of stepping into the digital world, and we're focusing on four new projects with four different types of data. Uh, and that's been uh, really exciting and developing different and new models and data sharing trusts amongst those four communities that we're working with. And I, if you want to hear more about that, there's a whole bunch of things in November's National Geographic. And then finally, I've been working closely with the Footprint Coalition and Robert Downey Jr and we are handing out seed grants to promote projects that focus on indigenous futurism and FAST grants. You can uh, access and apply for those things at experiment.com. And we're just very thankful and grateful for the support and managing that little portfolio. Here are a few of those projects and some of our incredible grantees that we've been working with. Um, and finally, we uh, put out a piece called Back to the Future in Grow Magazine, thinking about utilizing synthetic, synthetic biology and many different perspectives to remediate a lot of our landscapes here in Hawaii. And thank you to all types of people that have supported our work. So grateful. And now I will take your questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, great talk. So, so one of the things that, you know, I ask myself is genomic data is fueling precision medicine. It's one of, one of the components for precision medicine. And 
In order for that to work for everybody, a number of things needs to happen, and perhaps the most important is access to healthcare, right? Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't matter if we develop these technologies, people don't have access to healthcare. But another thing that we need is to share data, because currently, approaches for precision medicine work well for European descent people, because there's a lot of information, right? And as we are trying to kind of figure it out, you know, in a healthcare system, who's coming to be tested and start to make those correlations of why this works better here and there, one of those components is gonna be genetic ancestry. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we've been talking a lot um, about race, for example, how race is being used in medicine and whether we should not use race in medicine anymore, but we do know that people respond different and sometimes that correlates with their ancestry, yeah. whether you call it race or, or genetics. So in, in order to be able to, to move from this social construct of race and perhaps start using genetics as a proxy, which could also be confounded by social environmental things, we, we need to share data. So for example, currently we have a thousand genome project, which is a right. wonderful resource, but it's very limited. If I wanna figure it out, if some of our patients that we're sequencing, some of them may come from, from Hawaii. Yeah. Today, I just get them labeled as Asian. And if I try to identify with some patients that have African ancestry, it could be coming from different parts of Africa, I just can identify them as Yoruba. So somehow um, comes the question of trust that you were talking about. You know, yeah. How do we exchange that data so that when testing is happening, for example, we can start disentangling those complexities. And, and I'm finding that projects like Autobos, for example, could generate some of that, but there's always this complication between industry, which is doing the testing and implementing the cures and the data. So how do you see that conflict could be solved? Whew. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, big question, a lot to unpack there. And, and maybe I, I'm just gonna focus on how do we share some minimum amount of genetic information that could enable the kind of research without just giving away all of your data sovereignty? Yeah, it's a good question. There's, a, again, like a lot to unpack there. Um, one is, uh, I think, feel like there's this just dearth of education for participants. So uh, often, it's very easy to convince people to participate in your study if you tell them what they want to hear and you you know, kind of don't expose them to the potential use and misuse of information. Secondly, um, and it's, it's a good question. I mean, you know, obviously we're all wrestling with that. That's why we're here. Um, but there's often this greater good argument that gets kind of peddled around in terms of open access. Like, gone are the days of presenting something as open versus closed. That's binary. That's, that's unfair to everyone here. It's a draconian way, and NIH, listen, it's a draconian way of thinking about things that is not, that doesn't reflect the technologies that we've developed as a community of scientists. And I hope that we can move past the kind of greater good argument and get into the uh, who's greater good, right? Um, and, and I think that that's just extremely important, but it's, there, there's a lot to do. And then in terms of building trust, man, um, I've had the opportunity to work with in my own community and that has been a, a tremendous, so I, I, don't, I don't really know what else to say, but yeah, I hope that's helpful. Mm -hmm. I can hear you and I can repeat it, yeah. Um, so what I'm wondering is if you would share your thoughts on sort of how, how are you thinking about or are you in fact thinking about sort of playbooking what you've done here. The, there's, a, there's a lot you have the unique opportunity to do in terms of like um, interfacing with the community, language in common, mm -hmm. you know, um, family in common, et cetera. Like how, are you thinking about how do we package that in something that we can scale to other indigenous communities and work with, so that you can build this up and repeat what you've done instead of having everybody either 
reinvent the wheel or not have it happen at all? Great question. Uh, great question. So um, you were asking about the portability, because like, I think what happens is, and this is generally what happens with the federal government, for example, they couch all indigenous people into this one uh, monolith. I always talk to my students and I'm like, if you say Africa again, I'm going to lose it. It's not a monolith. It is so eternally complex. Um, and so the same goes for indigenous communities. So when you lump everything together and you say, okay, indigenous, well, that's not helpful because we have recognized, we have unrecognized, we have uh, historical tension between groups. Um, there are things that are going to be portable and then there are things that are not going to be, but I think like transparent dialogue and, and it is really important. So, yep. Yes, please. Hey, Kayla. Uh, look forward to our publication next week. Yeah. <laughs> uh, wanted to just ask if you could speak more explicitly on the international human right to science and how data sovereignty plays a role, not just with data sharing after the data have been generated, but in that upfront process of having people actually participate in the conduct of the science. Oh, okay. I, okay, let's just talk about tr like transforming people's everyday lives in our economy here in Hawaii, for example. I, and this is super sad, am the first Native Hawaiian to get a PhD in genome sciences. Yep. Yeah. And that is a failure of a lot of things. Most people in our communities do not have access to those opportunities in the data sciences. So what I would hope happens is, is we can create more literacy and fluency around these things. And you don't have to do genomics. I mean, climate science is just firing off right now. There's so many incredible opportunities in remote sensing. I just want to see more fluency and, and within our own community about that being like an actual vocation, you know? And I think that's like where we really need to start. The tourism industrial complex is not working for us. The military industrial complex is not working for us. What are you going to do, become the next MMA champ or become a musician? I mean, do the math. So, so, yeah, yeah, great question, yes. Hi, thank you for a great talk, I really appreciate it. So, um, I'm, I'm a program director at National Science Foundation, and I can tell you that the National Science Foundation is putting a lot of effort into kind of distributing the funding um, to minorities and uh, geographical areas that are not traditionally funding and so on. But the question is, what would you like to see funding agency like NISF doing in order to address some of the problems that you mentioned that are beyond just, you know, um, funding underrepresented, underrepresented minorities and so on. So regarding this uh, fairness and some of, some of the other issues that you mentioned, what would you like the, to see the funding agency doing about it? Great question. Um, I would say, I'll be frank, less nepotism. Uh, take <laughs> more risks, broadly. Uh, did you guys see that giant paper? I think it was in G3 or eLife or one of those things, and it was like, the just, this, it's like, do you understand how it feels to play a game at the carnival when you know it's rigged? That's how we feel every time I push submit on a grant that goes in. And so that's kind of the trajectory with large federal entities. I'll say it, you guys all know I'm right. I'm not lying, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, especially not in Hawaii, nay. So yeah, I mean, I would love to see, and I would love to see the grants broken down into smaller opportunities for people. I don't think the R01 system's working. That paper in science this week showed that we're not innovating it. No, I'm just <laughs> teasing. I don't know if everybody saw that. But, but I mean, I, mean I, I think it's, uh, I think we need an overhaul, you know? It sounds like you apply mostly to NIH. I do apply to NIH. I'm not even going to mess with them anymore. I'm just looking for, you know, I, I mean, everybody is, is frustrated. I would rather get private money. 
try NSF. We are doing a lot of work in order to make things better. All right, I got a lay for you right here. No, just, no, no. <laughs> yeah. I'll give you my card. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Phil. So, yeah. yeah, thank you for, I really enjoyed, and I re what I really enjoy is the way you think, and it's, it's really refreshing. And I want to ask a tangential question, really, but it just seems to me one that's incredibly important and you didn't touch on it really, which is about training, particularly mm. training of indigenous people. And I, I just really would love to get your thoughts on what people like me who are sort of responsible for training people should be doing. That's a really good question. I think that for the most part, a lot of our institutions are doing a good job. They're, they're allocating more money to increase diversity in terms of different walks of life. And I think we all understand that this isn't like some DEI pity party, that it actually increases our potential to innovate and our potential to understand the rest of the world and be uh, empathetic and symbiotic. But uh, I think there are also ways to improve that. Um, what is frustrating for me is, is like, I know that I have to take the I have to get the best up and coming Native Hawaiian students and try to get them to UCSD. I would rather have the NSF give me a hundred million dollars and then build an Indigenous Futures Institute in Hamakua. Train people. Just build infrastructure locally. Be in control of everything that we're doing here. But instead I have to be like, you know what? You should be in. You should go to Cambridge, Massachusetts and wear a pea coat. Have you ever worn a pea coat? Well, it's like, it's bizarre, it's, it's, it's like, it's just, it's, it's not, um, yeah, I would like to see us kind of decentralize a lot of access to that power and resources and those sorts of things, um, ultimately, yeah, yeah. But it's a good question. I have a lot more to say on that, but anything else, uh, folks? That's okay, I have some, oh yeah, Sherman. Thanks for a great talk. I just wanted to ask how you think about the role of art and your science and your science and your art and working in between those two. Great question. I love that. I am, I think we're all, I think the, I think the dichotomy of art and science is a myth. Like Lionel, or like, like I just look at like everybody from Miles Davis to Leonardo da Vinci. I think it's like there's, we lump people into one silo by gender. Um, my cousin was talking about how she was just told that she wasn't good at math her whole life. Or whatever. You know, I don't, think, I don't think it's helpful. And I think the more art you're exposed to, the better. Like even the way you represent colors in your R package with ggplot2 or whatever. Like it's all, it's all uh, to me it's, it's one, one, one beautiful chaotic thing. And, and I think that the more art we see as scientists, the better it's going to inform our perspectives. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you all for Thanks, everybody.